Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurn, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I give to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan, oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied. displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am withered away. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul also is sore vexed. And thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. Save me for thy loving kindness' sake. But in death there is no remembrance of thee. In Sheol, who shall give thee thanks? I am wearied with my groaning. Every night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye wasteth away because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine adversaries. Depart from me, ye, all ye workers of iniquity. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will deliver my prayer, will, will receive my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and so vexed. They shall turn back. They shall be ashamed suddenly. Now this is a prayer of a different kind from what we've been looking at. It's uh, one of the penitential psalms. And you remember when we started our introduction to the psalm right at the beginning, that we said that here in these 150 pieces of Hebrew poetry, we have the whole range of human experience and human emotion. That these are really the psalms of human life. They're not just bits of abstract poetry where the poet lets his imagination run riot and he, he talks a lot of nonsense, but very often you just can't understand. And I, I heard a fellow only yesterday on the car radio, he was, he was explaining some of his music, and he must have been a poet. I don't know who he was even, even now. But he was saying that this... this um, piece of music had inspired him to write some poetry and he read the poetry and I, I, I wondered what he'd been talking about. When he finished I couldn't understand a thing that he was saying. Well it's not like that with the psalmist. They were poets. 
But their poems are highly relevant. Their poems relate to their experiences, to their experiences in themselves, to their experiences with their fellow men, to their experience with God. And here again we have one of these psalms written out of a very, very deep experience. It's one of the penitential psalms. And there are throughout the psalms seven which have come to be known by Christians by the title of the penitential psalms. Uh, I'm not convinced really that all seven ought to have that title because uh, in some of the psalms there's not a great deal of evidence of penitence, of sorrow for sin. Certainly there's evidence of a good deal of suffering and the psalmist speaks to God out of the depth of his suffering. In fact, one of the psalms begins, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. But, uh, this is the first part, then, and you look at it. David is a sick man. By the way, what about the title? The title gives us an awful lot of trouble. I've been trying to find out what it means. The Shemini, it literally means the seventh, but nobody quite honestly knows what they mean. All kinds of possible explanations have been given for that title. It says, For the chief musician on stringed instruments set to the Shemini. And what does my margin here say? Uh, what does it say? I'm trying to find what it says and I can't see it. it. Well, it literally means the, the, the eighth. The eighth, I should say. And nobody knows what it means. Somebody suggests it's the eighth tune in a certain book of tunes. Well, if that were the case, you'd expect to find other tunes numbered in the same way, wouldn't you? The seventh, the fourth, the first, and so on. But that's not the case. This, uh, you only get reference to the eighth. And some have suggested that it means a sort of musical change, uh, that, that it's meant for, for certain voices, male voices that sing an octave lower than, than the female voices. But that doesn't take into account that the fact that Hebrew, Hebrew music is not like ours. Ours has eight notes and thirteen uh, half notes or, or semi, semi notes. But this is not the case with Eastern music. They didn't only have half tones, they had quarter tones as well. They had a, a, an entirely different scale. So this doesn't relate to the kind of music we sing either. Um, some of this as well, it, it has to do with, uh, with uh, a certain number of men who, who uh, used the musical instruments during the, the various services in the temple. And in fact, putting it very, very bluntly, after all their deliberations and after all their speculations, the scholars today must be forced to the conclusion that they really don't know what it means. So, uh, that's as much as I'm going to try to say about it. However, David is a sick man, and it seems that he's been lying awake all night, distressed in mind and body. Now, you can't avoid seeing this. He says, I am withered away, in verse 2, of my bones are vexed. He says in verse 6, I am weary with my groaning every night, make I my bed to swim, I water my couch with my tears. Be my eye wasted away because of grief. Here's a man who's in very, very great pain, so great that uh, he uses what I suppose is a typical Eastern exaggeration. He says that he, 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 he makes his bed to swim with the tears that he sheds. So that you can't doubt the, the extent of this person's distress. He, he, he's got certain physical physical sufferings, he says, my bones are vexed, it, the, the down to his very bones, and also he's mentally troubled too, because of certain enemies who are making things all the more difficult for him. Uh, he mentions this towards the, the eighth verse, depart from me all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. Incidentally, it has been suggested, and maybe with some cause, that the psalmist wrote the first seven verses, and then later on, when the situation had improved, he put the last three to the psalm, uh, because he says, the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. There's a change taking place in his situation. He's now got better. God has blessed him. However, there's no doubt in anguish. And yet, as I said, there's not a great deal in this psalm to suggest that he's acknowledging his sin. It's just a cry of pain. 
Notice, though, that he does suggest that God is angry with him. Verse 1, Rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chase me in thy hot displeasure. David believed that his suffering was the consequence of God's judgment upon him. Now, uh, I think that this is something that's taught in the Bible in a good many places. That God does exercise judgment and a chastening upon his people. In fact, what does the Hebrew letter say about this? Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. That's right. So God does sometimes allow us to come into these experiences in order that we might be made into better people. Mind you, this is not to say that all of our suffering is the result of sin, or our own sin. We're faced all through life with the terrible fact of cause and effect, and with the, with the fact too that very often people suffer because of the sins of other people. This is something that's absolutely unavoidable. People suffer because of the sins of other people. It was a big problem in the days of Jesus, you remember. In John chapter 9, there's the story of a man born blind. <coughs> And the disciples saw this man, and they came to Jesus, and they said, Lord, who was it who sinned that this man should be born blind? Did he sin himself? Or did somebody, did his parents sin? Now, that's an interesting question, you see. Did he sin himself or was born blind? Ah, well, you see, the thing is, some of the Jews believed that it was possible for a, a, a person to sin, <coughs> In a previous existence, so that when he came into this world, he was born with a, with a physical okay. disability, in this case, blindness. But Jesus dismissed that question. He said, neither this man nor his parents. But for the works of God may be made manifest. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is today. For the night comes when no man can work. Jesus dismisses the question as to the responsibility for this man's sickness. But it is a fact that people do suffer today because of the sins of other people. And yet at the same time, uh, people do not always suffer immediately because of their own sin. Evidently, the psalmist thought that he was suffering because of God's displeasure. And he said, have mercy on me, heal me. Then he says, how long, O Lord? In other words, how long are you going to be angry with me, I suppose? Or how long am I going to be sick? It may be a combination of both. So he believes that this is God's chastening. Chasten me not in my hot displeasure. Uh, of course, it's impossible to pinpoint a particular event in David's life uh, which occasioned this particular psalm. There was another instance that's famous, as you know, Psalm 51, which is quite distinctly related to the sin that David committed in taking the wife of another man and having that man killed. You, you remember the, the case of Uriah the Hittite and, and his wife Bathsheba. Now, psalm 51, in the very title, tells us that this psalm was written uh, in connection with that, that event. But Psalm 6 is something quite different. We just don't know about it. Notice what he says. He's so afraid he's going to die. He says, save me in my loving kindness. Verse 5, for in death there is no remembrance of thee. In Sheol, who shall give thee thanks? Now, this is a very interesting uh, little section of the psalm. Because not only does David think that uh, this sickness is going to result in his death, but it gives you an idea of how imperfect people's view was of the life after death in those days. You know, we talk about heaven today, and we talk about the resurrection, we talk about eternal life, and, and uh, to us these things are quite easy to understand and quite easy to accept. But you must never forget that we can only talk like this simply because, as Paul says, the Lord Jesus has brought life and immortality to the life of the gospel. We must not forget that we're indebted to Jesus Christ for all that we know and believe about life after death. He's brought this new revelation, and in the New Testament, we've got a, an adequate picture of what's going to happen. But in Old Testament times, it wasn't like that. And even though we're dealing with the people of God, you must not think that they had a very clear belief in life after death. In fact, they didn't. The whole of their religion was uh, geared to meet the situations that developed on earth. They were God's people in a physical way, 
And they're looking for God's blessing in a physical way. They believe, quite simply, that if they honored God, they'd be blessed, and if they, if they displeased God, they'd be punished. And they believe that the, the punishment and the blessing came in this life instantly. All you had to do to live a happy life was to, was to be good and to do good. And if you wanted to, uh, to do wrong, then of course you could expect God to come down on you like a clap of thunder right here and now. Well, that sounds awfully well, and it, it would certainly be very, very simple if it worked out like that. But they discovered it didn't work like that either. They discovered that very often, and the psalmist himself, as we'll see later on, has the same problem. Very often, wicked people got on, and good people suffered. And, you know, it's a tragedy today that you get people who say, well, why is this happening to me? You know, only this week, on two occasions, I've talked to people. One day they said, I always lost my faith, because my husband died, because he was a good man and he suffered, and why should my husband suffer? You know, it's the old primitive idea that if you're good, you shouldn't suffer. And if you're wicked, you should suffer. But it just does not work out in human life like that at all. That is not true to human experience. And it, it leaves out a whole number of things. It omits, for example, the use that God can have in suffering. And the, the effect of, of discipline on our lives that God can, can bring to bear when He permits us to suffer. Uh, how He brings us closer to Himself when we suffer. Uh, it's been my experience that the people who've enjoyed the rude health, as we sometimes put it, are not always the people who have the best awareness of God's existence or the greatest sense of the need of God. Uh, you know, if, if you never have a little illness in your life, <coughs> then of course you do not learn dependence on God. Uh, you know, you get quite happy the way that things are. And furthermore, you do not learn sympathy from other people. This is a tremendous thing to do that suffering. A person who's suffered, if that suffering has done its work properly, will have developed the capacity for understanding and feeling and sympathizing with others. It's the person who, who is always healthy, who never needs to go to the doctor, who never, never has a day off in his life, who just does not understand the sufferings of other people and cannot sympathize with them. And this is true. So suffering has its purpose. But these people didn't feel like that. They felt that if you were suffering hardship, if you were walked out of poverty, if you lost anything, that was God's punishment, and you must have been a very wicked man. Job had the same problem. His sympathizers came along, and, and make no mistake, they certainly did sympathize, because for three days they sat down beside him and they never spoke a word to him. And that is sympathy, you know, when, when a person can come into your home and doesn't have to speak to you. But you know by his very presence, that he's feeling what you're feeling. He's understanding at least something of what you're passing through. And there's this, uh, this uh, empathy, uh, the word that is used, between you, that makes speech unnecessary. Well, Job was like that. His three, the first three came along and they sat down beside him and they didn't speak for three days until all the tender agony and anguish in the heart of Job burst out. And he said, why did that die the moment I was born? And then they felt this was the time to talk to him. But not understand this suffering. Uh, but one of them, of course, I, I added fuel to the fire, and he said, well, you must have been a terrible sinner because you're suffering so terribly. That's the way to make friends, isn't it, and to influence people. You must have been a terrible sinner, Joe, because otherwise you, you wouldn't be suffering like that. It was the same idea, you see. If you're suffering, it's because you've sinned. And uh, they, they couldn't understand how it was that the righteous people sometimes have to suffer, and wicked people sometimes seem to prosper. Now, their idea was when you died, you went to Sheol. And the psalmist here says, In death there is no remembrance of thee. When a person was dead, so far as they knew, he was farther away from God than he was during his lifetime. It was a place of darkness. It was a land of forgetfulness. <coughs> the wicked and righteous were alike together in Sheol. So that, on the whole, if you read through the early Old Testament passages about Sheol, the place of the dead, it was a very gloomy place indeed. And there's no resemblance to the heaven that we know of as Christians. Now, uh, of course, because they realized that God must be a God of justice and righteousness, this idea changed. Bit by bit, God revealed to his people through the prophets but there will come a time when righteousness will be vindicated and sin will be punished. 
when people uh, who seem to be suffering wrongly will have the balance redressed. And the people who are getting away with murder, so to speak, and sometimes in a literal sense, will have to stand before the judge. So, God revealed that there would come a time of resurrection. Uh, Daniel, uh, in a marvelous passage, says that they who sleep in the dust shall arise. This was new. And that there comes not only the, 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 the time of resurrection, but the time of judgment. When the record is set right, when righteousness is vindicated, and wickedness is punished, this develops in the Old Testament, you see, this idea of the future life gradually was revealed to these people, like many other truths were revealed to them. But even when Jesus came, the doctrine was still not solidly set by her foundation. Because you remember there's a great dispute among the scribes and the Sadducees, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees about this. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in eternal life. They believed, they still held to the idea that in this life you must serve God disinterestedly. That is to say, without hope of reward and without fear of punishment. Of course, another good theory. You know that you shouldn't expect to, you shouldn't expect a reward for being good, and you shouldn't fear a punishment if you're wicked. But uh, as it turned out, the Sadducees were the one who were the materialists of the age. They knew how to turn a penny. They were the ones to whom you'd go for advice on your stocks and shares if you had any in those days. They were the businessmen of the age. They knew how to make money. And they were always scrupulous as to the way that they did it, in spite of their dictum that said, you must serve God without fear of, of punishment or hope of reward. They were chapter number one. And the Pharisees on the other hand were different. Whatever you might say about the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy, because of their narrow-mindedness, they certainly did believe in the life after death. They believed in resurrection. They believed in judgment. They believed that man does not end with the grave. But this dispute went on, you see. And that's why uh, the Sadducees came along on one occasion to Jesus with that question. Who is a woman who gets married and her husband dies? And according to the law, if a man dies and has no son, then his, uh, his brother must marry his, his brother's widow and, and, and bring up a family to the name of, of uh, his dead brother. And once they, they stretched it out, they made it so ridiculous. Well, you see, there were seven brothers all together, you see, and they all followed the law, and one by one, they all married this woman. Now, with this life of yours that's coming up to death, whose wife is she going to be? Because they're all married to her. Of course, it might happen today, and you not find the same case when, when, when uh, a widow marries again, and has had, I suppose, in the course of her life, two husbands. But Jesus says, you're making a big, a big mistake. In the first place, you don't even know the scriptures. Where God says, I am the God of the living. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, when God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these men were dead to anything from 700 to 1500 years. So according to the Sadducees, God should have said, I was their God. They're gone now. They're finished. But I was their God while they were here. But Jesus says, the fact that God says, I am their God still, means that somewhere they still exist. So you don't even know your own scriptures. And you don't know the power of God that is able to raise men from the dead. And furthermore, he said, when you get to heaven, there has the angels, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. In other words, the relationship of marriage that we have here is a, is a, is a, is a, a relationship designed for this world and only for this world. It will not exist, it will not continue in the life after death. There, there will be no marriage, nor giving a marriage. This does not mean, and I say this just on the side, this does not mean that we shall not recognize each other, we shall not know each other, and we shall not feel close to each other. But it does mean this, that over and above the human relationship of husband and wife that you may sustain now, or son or daughter, father or mother, that is the relationship of brother or sister in, in Christ, the spiritual relationship is the more important one, more important than the physical one. If there's a husband and wife who are members of the church, then a important as their human relationship is, much more important, much more durable, much more durable is the relationship of brother and sister in Christ. And this is what binds us closer together. And that's what Jesus is saying. But the, the Sadducees brought this problem along, you see, just trying to trap Jesus. And uh, this continued 
right on into the New Testament age, you remember. You know, the, the opposition that the early church met in the first place did not come from the Pharisees. It came from the Sadducees. And do you know why? Because the early Christians went about preaching that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now that was something the Sadducees didn't believe in. They tried to stop them preaching the resurrection because they didn't believe in it. That's why they persecuted the church. But as Paul says, Christ has brought light and immortality to light through the gospel. He set it on a firm foundation. So here we have this interesting, to get back to the sound now, while we have this interesting little, little uh, reference to Sheol, you can see the imperfect state of the psalmist's knowledge at this point. But as I say, it may end in, in agony, in misery, in deep depression, but it finishes on a note of victory. As I, 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 I'm rather inclined to believe that he probably did, first of all, write the, the seven verses, and then was guided to write verses 8, 9, and 10 later, when he's able to say, The Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. He's better again. And of course, He's conscious of God's victory over his enemies. All my enemies shall be ashamed and sore vexed. They shall turn back. They shall be ashamed suddenly. Now, I'll, let me give you a couple of, of minutes for, for questions. That was the, or comments. That was the first bell, wasn't it? Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise for it was grace that bought my liberty I do not know just why he came to love me so he looked me on my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for Sing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay, where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want
want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground.